Hello, hello, hello. First and foremost, um, thank you guys for coming down tonight. It's much appreciated. You know, there's many ways you could have spent your summer evening and you chose to come and spend it with us. So we're grateful. Um, for anyone that's looking to get into the music industry, we're currently offering internship roles here at Mixtape Madness. So if you feel your skill set's more aligned with A&R, scan that QR code over here. And if you feel that your skill set is more aligned with marketing, as it were, kindly scan the QR code above Josh's handsome hairstyle. <laughs> so, um, yes. For those that don't know, my name's Quabs. I'm one of the co-founders of Mixtape Madness. And um, similar to many of you guys at the start of your music careers, Mixtape Manis was born during like a quote unquote economic slash music recession as it were, which is part of the reason why we felt it was so important to put this event on tonight and we want to do many more events as well. Um, but f let me introduce you to my esteemed guests on the panel. And part of the reason why we've selected the panel we've selected here today is because many of these individuals I've had the pleasure of working with in some capacity, way, shape or form. And I've got a lot of respect for what they've accomplished in their careers and what they continue to do in their career as well as mine. Um, the first and foremost, I want to introduce Wiz, who is the owner and CEO of Bermuda Music. His management skill set, you know, I'll let him get into that, but there's many big artists within the UK music industry that you're familiar with, as well as smaller ones that he's played a massive hand in their careers. I believe even the first time I met Wiz, is it what, 10, 15 years ago, outside the Warner building? And just to kind of see where he's come from now to work with big international acts such as Skilly Bang is amazing. Then we've got Aman here from Pets for Music which is a successful music company that's created music just for pets. And he recently sold the company for eight figures. So when I say eight figures, that's north of 10 million, but less than 99 million. You can pick somewhere in between there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Josh, who's had an illustrious career with him music. Who, um, he danced around with the majors and now he's at Sound On as the head of a &R there across Europe, if I'm correct. And then last but definitely not least is Susie, who's a A&R manager at Warner Chapel. And just from the emails I received in my inbox, she manages to kind of orchestrate some of the most impressive sessions that you'll come to appreciate when, once she gives you the whole breakdown and story. So without further ado, I guess I'll let Wiz kick off by taking us on his journey within the music industry and hopefully there'll be a few nuggets that you guys can take away from it. Yeah, good evening everyone. Obviously, I'm, I've never really done this before. I'm not really a speaker like that, but I did it for Mixtape Madness. You know, these were like the first people that I engaged with when I got into the music industry. So I kind of have like a rapper's background, you know, like the rappers are from the streets and they come into music and all that. But I didn't want to rap. I wanted to do business, I wanted to own a record label, publishing company, whatever, so on and so forth. So, came into the music game, I came in with an artist, I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna just break all this down. No, no, but I think, I think it's, relevant it's relevant, because where you come from to where you yeah. are now is very impressive. Ah, right, cool, yeah, so basically I was in the streets doing what, so on and so forth, had enough. Uh, there was a boom, there was a boom happening, but I, I was in LA, I went to LA, just live in La Vida Loca, came back and I was like, raw. Just someone was telling me about music, but I weren't really paying attention. Then I went to LV. Like my friend wanted to go to LV. I didn't want to go to LV, but he wanted to go to LV. So I followed him. And we met a we just met a random American guy, but he had he had on LV and Supreme. So I was like, raw, this guy, who is this guy? Like I d you just don't get LV and Supreme drops just like that. And he was in LV. So I spoke to him. Um, moving forward, he told me he was Scissor's producer, and Scissor just dropped uh, her album, her first album, and it just went like, pff, I don't know, platinum, triple platinum, whatever it went. So he was American, he was in London, and he was like, raw, I'm trying to get into the this territory from early. So his name is Thank God for Cody. So he, um, I met him and his manager, and they was like, bro, get out of the streets. 
just get out of the streets, get into music, English, English, um, this is gonna be the next big territory. And I think Drill was like bubbling and all of that. And I said, yeah, cool. This was, I think 2018, yeah, 2018. We was in the Rosewood, like he convinced me, these guys convinced me, cause they was like, they was living it up. They was young, they said like literally he was struggling probably like six months ago. And now he's in the Rosewood in London. His scissors like one of the biggest artists at the moment. So I got into the music industry, started with an artist called Also Wavy J. He was just a young boy from my area. Quabs, Quabs, uh, Kingsley, one of the co-founders, he's from my area, so I reached out to him. He put me through to Mixtape Madness, started working with Also oh Wavy J. But I think what's important to even emphasize about Also oh Wavy is that the area that Wizard from, he could have picked like any of the road rappers there, any type of drill, aggressive, any type of artist. Also oh Wavy was just very innovative for his time. And you know, he didn't maybe he didn't reach the career heights that he would have expected, but even from then, I got an insight into Wizard's head that he thinks different when it comes to music. Yeah, so also Wavy J was just like a, I had another rapper, he was from my area, it was called Tell Money. And he was like, bro, this guy's really good, like look into him. And I thought, you know what, let's try with him. He's like left of everything. So we started working with him, doing really well. Met a guy called, um, we dropped our first song. I can't remember the beat, but it was a really good beat. We um, dropped our first song and someone from Warner hit us up. He was name was Maxim Ryder at the time. If he was in music at the time, he was hitting up every artist. Like literally, he was on the gram, he was a hungry A and R. And then he invited me into Warner and we started working. He was the first person to like actually like from a major label or whatever perspective, give man an opportunity. I was working with Mixtape Madness as well, like doing bits and bobs with also AVJ. Unfortunately, he just one day he just didn't want to rap. But I was already forward thinking. I was already thinking about the business. I was learning publishing. I, um, I signed up to a publishing um, uh, agency or something like that. So, and then I, I learned publishing. I was learning the record side. And then I met somebody called Shawnee Ka uh, Ka Caballero. She's uh, another person we all came up with. And she was, a per she was like one of the main people who was like, told me, yo, focus on publishing as well. Like, you gotta understand publishing. So I understood that, took that in. And then, you know, built Bermuda Music with my um, business partner. So we we was just like, oh, we're gonna make songs. We've got artists, you know, just trying. You know what I'm saying? Had a little bit of money, decided to put, believe in ourselves. Then we started working, 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 working uh, with Mixtape Madness, because they were supporting us like, Quabs, Kingsley, Eddie, you know. And they was also inspiration because they were from the same place we was from, you know what I'm saying? And like, Eddie and me had a similar background. Kingsley, I knew Kingsley from, he was young. I didn't know Quabs, but when I met Quabs, I understood why Quabs was in the position he's in. So, yeah, I actually met Quabs in um, Warner, in passing. I just had a meeting with uh, Maxim. Maxim said, raw, talk to Quabs. And then that's how me and Quab started our relationship. Like I said, also AVJ decided he didn't want to rap no more. So we decided to, we just carried on doing what we was doing regardless. And I ended up, I knew the Homerton boys, the the, um, the Niners as, as they're known. So I decided to start working with V9 and KO, but um, KO decided. There's, a, there's an interesting part of the chapter because while you're doing that, yeah. That's when you start working with um, arguably one of the biggest underground producers who went on to produce not only with for many members of the 98s, but produced on Digger's tape as well. Oh yeah, all right, yeah, we, did, we forgot about that part. Yeah, so basically, obviously, like I said, um, Quabs did say, I, I believe I'm forward thinking and I uh, kind of like know what I want to do. I'm a, I'm a fan, I'm a consumer as well in it, so I kind of feel like I know good music. So. I started working with producers because producers, you know, they're the baseline of this music. You know, you get the right beat, you don't have to do too much. You get the wrong beat, you got to do everything. So I started working with producers. Um, started uh, started managing a, a producer from Denmark called Swidham. Then I started managing Tifo and Mason. And this was the same time I was working with R14. 
I was working with X10. I was working with all these producers, but I weren't managing them. I was just managing these three, as long as well as the 98s and V9. So we was uh, doing what we was doing, building up the producer side of things, because obviously I'm familiar with publishing. You know, we had great success. Started. Um, and I think there's another key thing though where he's overlooking as well is that when he's working with these producers, he don't work with producers as a yes man. Right, so many people are afraid to push back to artists and producers. Wiz is not that guy, and if you've been in a studio session with Wiz, he's not there just on his WhatsApp. He's he's the type of guy to say like, "No, that's whack." He's very explicit. You don't care who you are, he'll let you know. So, I think that's very important for a lot of the young emerging talent to kind of realize as well. You're not gonna get nowhere by just being a yes man or woman. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, I think that's something we need to eradicate in the in the UK industry right now. We got too many yes men. We got, you know, I think obviously we had a big surge in it with drill in it. And I feel like it was a lot of young boys just wanting to tell their story from their area. Not a lot of passionate musicians. You know what I'm saying? You know, we have, if like I've worked in many territories now. And you know, like when I've gone to America, when I'm in the Caribbean, like the artists are passionate for music. Like a lot of the artists here, they just, just rap or they just make music in it. They just want to say their story, you know what I'm saying? So um, I think we need to eradicate that. We need pe more people who are like, look, bro, you need to be forward thinking. Look, bro, you need to make music. People, you know, I've got a lot to say about TikTok, saying TikTok, oh, it's ruined music. I don't think that. TikTok is a big platform that gets your music out there, if it's good. And if it doesn't, cause it might sound, you know, silly to some people or to whatever, it might sound like a bit childish, but that means it's reaching a big audience. You know what I'm saying? And loads of different music blows on TikTok. So TikTok is a vital thing. It's, there's not, for me, there's nothing such as TikTok music. It's just music that's been picked up by a wide audience because it's good. There's, you're definitely right. There's definitely loads of niches on um, a platform such as uh, TikTok. And so before I move on to Aman, uh, you've touched on your ear to not only limit yourself to the UK, but to look at the rest of the world. So, you know, you've mentioned you've touched base with producers in other parts of Europe. Can you give us a quick insight into how you connected dots with Skilly Bang? So we... Um we went oh, sorry, for those of you that are unaware, Skilly Bang is a very popular dancehall artist. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, basically, Bermuda Music, we, we was, it must have been COVID, I'm sure we won't get in trouble, but we decided to go to Jamaica, so we was in Jamaica, um, just on a holiday, and one of my friends was just like, you know what, you need to link up Jamaican and um, um, English artists, and I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to try that when I get back. Did a song with KO and Chronic Law, it was all right. Made a link to Skilly Bang's uncle and his dad. You know, went to Jamaica, met them, uh, vibes with the team. We made a song um, with Skilly and Unknown T. And then um, we dropped that, or we put the video on Mixtape Madness. So Fascinating story, actually. When, when he had the song for Skilly Bang, he was signing up in Jamaica. I was in a recycle center in Enfield, and I almost dropped the TV on my foot. Like, what, Skilly Bang? Like, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's how we made the thing. And then we decided, um, you know, once we did that song, the analytics that we got back from the song showed us that music in the Caribbean, because we have a problem here. When we, when we um, release our music, it goes to Europe. It's in the UK, but it, strugg it goes to the US, but it struggles in the US. But in the Caribbean, as soon as you drop music, it's all over the Caribbean, straight to America as well, instantly. So we kind of, for us, we decided that the Caribbean, because Africa's already taken off, we believe the Caribbean's the next big territory. So we decided to start working there. We actually got a freestyle platform in the Caribbean at the moment called Garrison Vibes. We use it as an A&R tool to find new artists, emerging artists in the Caribbean. You know, we drop freestyles, we go into the garrisons, you know, we meet artists, we record their freestyle, just like we got the influence from our mixtape madness on their next stop. So we go over to we go over to Jamaica, we will probably roughly shoot in a three weeks period, we'll shoot like 30, 40 episodes, and then we come back here and we do the marketing from here. So, you know, they get the benefit of music coming here, but we also get the benefit of working with artists who 
have a huge potential to, you know, cross over the world. That's, and that's amazing, man. Massive thank you for that whiz. Uh, now moving on to Aman and Pets for Music. That's correct. Pets, sorry, Music for Pets. I'm moving one myself. Music for Pets. That's correct. You heard it here that he managed to build a successful business literally making music for pets. So it would be great if you could give us an insight into that story and your journey into entrepreneurship and how life has been, I guess, since, you know, that eight-figure exit. It's been chill. Um, I think, yeah, how I got into it. So for me, I was always passionate about music. And um, I just didn't know, you know, how to get into the industry. But So when I graduated, I've been a music entrepreneur for like 10 years and um, graduated, worked in recruitment. I was like, recruitment is a hard grind. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, like do sales, uh, it teaches you everything. And I was doing um, 12 hours a day, seven till seven. Then I had this little idea first, which was like music for like sleeping because I was struggling to sleep with a stressful job and uh, found a music producer in El Salvador which happens to be, at the time, one of the most violent countries in the world. But he was the only guy I could afford. I had like 50 quid. I was like, look, man, can you just make some tracks and see what we can do? And um, so yeah, working 12 hours a day in recruitment, come back, literally like, I used to eat pot noodles, (laughs) which is so bad. And then uh, work from like 9 p.m. till 2 a.m. until uh, my manager pulled me aside one day and was like, he was like, oh, man, you need to like stop smoking weed. <laughs> and I, I've never smoked weed in my life, but my eyes were red. I just, because I was just working on, you know, you had to just sacrifice this time to work on this hustle. And then it got to a point where it was making um, a little bit of money. And I was at the age of for okay, I've just been a broke ass student anyway. If I quit my job now, I'm not going to be any more broke. So. <laughs> I got nothing to lose, um, so yeah, I just started scaling that, and then um, was making a bit of money. Then I had another idea, which was um, it was kind of like a music discovery app. So um, this was always a side hustle, this music for humans, relaxation, and then um, and then within this, that's the side hustle was another side hustle, which was a music for dogs thing, which I was experimenting, but. The main thing was this music discovery app where I raised uh, money from investors, uh, venture capital, angel investors, all that stuff. And um, it was doing well. It was doing really well. But it made me realize I was in a very competitive like music game. And um, all these um, VCs and everyone that you're dealing with, it gets like super political. And um, there's a lot of feedback on it. Should I hold it like this, or is that it? No, you're is that right? right? Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it got like really like political, and I think for me after that, I started to realize this isn't the type of like music company I want to build because you had like PRS and all these guys like coming after you, and um, and then and you had all your investors, and for me it was one of those things. I thought, okay yeah, I can't do this. Like, what type of business do I want to build? And the music industry is, like, so savage in different areas. And I I quit that business, and I went full-time on this side hustle, which was music for humans. And then the side hustle of the side hustle was a music for dogs, which was the thing that I went all in on. But I had complete control. And I did not realize until the acquisition of the business how rare it is to own 100% of your music. So I owned the masters, the publishing, the sound recording, everything. But because I was so naive to the music industry, which is actually probably a benefit, the less you know about an industry, like for me, benefited me. I thought it was normal to own 100% of everything. And I remember during the acquisition, they were like, oh, who's your publisher? Or who who's owns the sound recordings? Who owns them? I was like, me. And um, they, were, they were like super shocked. It's so rare to own 100%. But yeah, just um, used viral marketing to give you an example. Like the seven years I had this music for pets thing, I think my total marketing spend on scaling 
to 50 million pets around the world streaming our music cost me five thousand dollars that is insane <laughs> hey to give you context here yeah, to give you context right i've been in buildings here yeah, where on one single people have spent 200k <laughs> Right? There's no, no, no. You know what? There's certain songs that you, if you see on streaming platforms now that has done a billion streams, like nine times out of ten, if that's signed in one of the one of these um, major label buildings, someone has slapped six figures on that, and this guy's telling you he only spent five thousand dollars. Right, what's the exchange rate right now? <laughs> it's about three thousand pounds. <sighs> Mad. To scale to like fifty million pets around the world streaming our music, we just dominate. I remember once. I think Warner Music released the album for Cats. And they got this famous producer, or whatever it was, I don't know. And uh, Buster spent millions on PR. And um, we ended up getting all the traffic. <laughs> oh, we got all the traffic, so thank you for paying for Wait, why is it? <laughs> why is it so low? Why is that figure so low? What, in terms of the marketing spend? We just knew how to growth hack viral marketing. That's it. So there was a, there was a lot of things, like word of mouth. I, and that's the thing, when we spoke to our audience, like word of mouth marketing, we asked them, they were like, out of everyone that uses this, that uses it on a dog, like how many other dog owners do you tell? And they told like seven. So the multiplier effect on that is insane. Yeah, that's nuts. And it just kind of grew from there. So it's a very, very profitable business. I've got approached for acquisition. Um, you know, you usually like pet food companies or whatever it is approached us. And um, I wasn't really entertaining that conversation. It's kind of like what you were saying earlier. Don't be a yes man. Because it was, re it was really good money from the others. But I knew that if I sold it, I'd be like, I wouldn't be happy. Uh, so I told all those pet companies, I'll like, just do one. Like, I'm not, I'm not on it. And... Um, I thought, let it continue making money. And then, um, yeah, I got approached by this big hip hop label, Create Music Group. I think mostly they do hip hop, right? So, um, yeah, they approached us. And it was a bit weird at the time because I didn't, I'm a big fan of hip hop. I listen to hip hop. You didn't see the synergy? Yeah, I didn't see it. So, because I remember when, um, what, they got like Tory Lanes and he was going to prison for something. And uh, I, I was a bit confused. I thought, how's this going to work? Because where does like cute, fluffy pet music brand and you've got Tori and like all these other guys that they have. But um, that's when I started to learn about the, the music industry and, um, and hip hop and how it all works in, in Hollywood. But um, yeah, then we, then we got acquired last year. And um, I enjoy it now because I don't get to focus on the business stuff. I get to focus more on the creative stuff. So definitely the, the best decision I made. Yeah, that's an amazing accomplishment. So well done again. And I think there's another example there of not allowing the UK to, to act as a boundary for your creativity, your entrepreneurship, or how you navigate within music, as the examples he's illustrated. Now moving on to our good friend, Josh from Sound On. Hello. Um my journey in the music industry started when I was pretty young. Like, when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I was playing in bands in Ireland, Northern Ireland, where I'm from. And in order to get my own band on the bill at shows, I started booking the shows myself. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, like, pretty soon after that, realized I enjoyed putting the gig on more than playing the gig, right? <clears throat> so did that from like... Does that mean you weren't that good at playing the game? Ah, maybe, 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 maybe. It was, was pretty much about that. So I did that until I was about like 18. Moved to Liverpool to go to university in a music school called Lippa. And kept on putting gigs on there. They got bigger and bigger in Liverpool, Northwest England. By the time I was graduating, I was booking shows for like Tom O'Dell, Bastille, um, and up until that point, I'd been in the live industry as an individual entrepreneur for like five odd years, made some good money doing that, and ended up actually getting offered an internship at Warner Brothers Records in Los Angeles. And 
I moved over there for a little bit with the money I made from putting shows on, but also my student loan. <laughs> um, and I did that for a while, interned out there, came back to the UK, and I worked in London for a little bit at Warner Music International, doing a and r and marketing. This was like at a time where the industry was hitting a super low point, like towards the end of the piracy era. All you lot are probably too young to even remember, like when Napster and LimeWire, and all these lot were like destroying the CD industry. It's, it's at that point that I entered records. So it was a strange time for music. It was very limited opportunity. They bundled roles into each other. Um, when I moved into the London office, I ended up working for one of the icons of 20th century A&R, Seymour Stein, signed the Ramones, Madonna, the Smiths, the Cure. Crazy that I even got near the guy, but I was his London-based A&R while I was at Warner the first time around. They went to Sony for a little bit, did international marketing, hated it, moved back to Warner in a paid role. Um, the only job I could get at the time back at Warner was in a thing called ADA. And I was like, what the fuck is ADA? It's not Warner Brothers Records. It's not Atlantic Records. It's distribution. This is all the way back when all you knew about distribution was it was something like old rock bands who didn't want to do a frontline deal anymore did. My first encounter with meaningful distribution was being a part of the team that signed Stormzy into Warner on Gang Signs and Prayer. It was at that point, you know, 2016, 2017, that things were like in the hip hop and rap space looking like for the first time, like people were setting up and paying like the most more attention to that scene than they were in other spaces like pop and dance and things like that. So that was my first real encounter in like meaningful frontline, you know, artist driven partnerships via a distribution framework. Uh, but before then, my understanding of that space was like distribution outside of major labels was self-serve, you know, offerings into the DSPs outside of the industry. But that all changed, from, for me at least, from my encounter, it all changed when Stormzy came around, right? And we thought that he's brought the peak to us. Um, from there, I ended up doing a dual role in marketing and A&R for ADA. We relaunched an old imprint called East West Records, which, you know, it had Missy Elliott, it had Muse, all these other artists. You know, like when we were starting to look a little healthier as a recorded industry, all the majors pulled all the imprints back out that they dusted off, you know, when Napster came around. Uh, but East West didn't work out <clears throat> and you know, it was sort of closed down, and most of the people from that, that project moved on, except for me. Um, that was like at a time where a &R was starting to slowly evolve, right? When I, when I got into A&R meaningfully, I was spending a lot of my time in, rec in studios. I was giving, you know, studio sessions to artists. I was sitting listening to records, making notes for producers, for mixers, choosing the mastering engineer, whatever it is. But the Americans really started to refer to something as a &R research. And we're like, what's a &R research? Data-driven a &R. These analytical tools started coming out. People started like weighing up artists against what was happening on Instagram or well, how many streams a day a track was doing and where it was doing it. And all of a sudden, you know, decisions were being propped up by information more and more and more and more. And the UK, as ever, was five years behind the US on that culture. Well, Warner ended up buying a company that gave us all of that analytical offering. Are you allowed to tell us the name of the company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sodatone was the name of the company. So, East West Records disappeared overnight. Warner oh, oh, by the way, East West Records also had a famous artist called Quabs. But yeah. we're not the same person. We're not the yeah. same person. No, yeah, yeah. East West Records wasn't working out, right? Meanwhile, Warner bought Parlophone Records from Universal, who bought it from EMI. So, 
Max Lusada, Paul Samuels, Mark Mitchell, those guys, because I had a background in A&R and in digital, for them that was enough to go, you're, you're going to be the guy who handles the Soda Zone thing in the UK and brings and like the A&R research thing, the data-driven A&R, the analytics into the UK company. From there, I did it as the guy who ran the A&R research department at Parlophone, Parlophone Label Group. We had GRM, we had DL, we had FFRR. Um, and you know, through those research protocols that we developed, um, you know, I was a part of signing Tones and I, who if you know the song Dance Monkey, 13 weeks at number one in the UK, signed like this crazy record from a Finnish artist called The Studio Killers, um, called Jenny, and then 2019, it was the most used sound on TikTok for at least a period of time. Um, and you know, outside of that, we, we find artists like Pink Panther S through, through those reports and the way we, we, we discovered artists. Um, and that was a really meaningful evolution. I think for me, my career has always like, just as you sort of think, is, is this making sense? The past two or three or four years have have become the sum of all the parts that lead on to your next move, right? So for me, right, it was like being a concert promoter in Ireland, then into Liverpool in England, somehow that translated into getting like a, an internship at Warner Brothers Records because it was also part of my degree. Um, from there, I didn't love the idea that I fell into marketing, but it was a really difficult time in recorded music. Fell into marketing for like a year, back into a and part of like one of the most meaningful moments in British hip hop, um, all the way up through to Parlophone, having some crazy times in Quite honestly, an area of A&R that people didn't want anything to do with five or so years ago. Years ago, now, like it's hard to find an A&R person who's who's of the traditional mode, right? The guy in the studio does he even no exist? Do, you know. So it's like I started out being that I was like the the guy that you know had to take on the piece of the homework no one wanted to do, and now the rest of the guys they're not there anymore, right? And, so you know, I respect the fact that you've managed to kind of pivot at many times in your career, and I think yeah. that's a running theme here as well. Mm. Not being afraid to pivot, try something new, push different boundaries, and I'm sure when we get onto Susie, we're going to hear more examples of that as well. Was it a massive career move, though, given where you you know you've gone through the, the traditional label ecosystem? You've asserted yourself. You built a name for yourself. Even when you, when even when Pink Panther is on your C, your CV, that's an amazing artist, right? So to make the decision to then go to um, Sound On was that almost like how do I describe it? I had a stable job when I was about to do mixtape madness, and my, you know, my wife, but girlfriend at the time was pregnant, right? Yeah. I told her I wanted to quit the job to do mixtape madness. She's um, of Jamaican origin, so there's certain patois um, slang <laughs> that I won't repeat on the, on the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, how was that transition for you? Look, for me, right, I, you know, like being an A&R, like part of your job is to predict what's gonna happen next, right? For me, I'd been at Warner Music Group at that moment for eight, eight years, right? And uh, I had an amazing time there. It wasn't always so great, but it wasn't always so bad. But a lot of what led to our decision making, say for the two or three or four years prior to me leaving, was based on, I wouldn't say based on TikTok, but based on the event of things like TikTok, right? The democratization of the audience. Um, and I think it spun out a lot of recorded music companies who, who had more of a legacy-based presence in the industry. They didn't necessarily know how to adapt quick enough to adding value in a new way, in a new media. And when TikTok decided to open up the doors to an artist and label services offering for artists who wanted to get their music onto Spotify or anything else, by facilitating the event of Sound On, I was like, yeah, I can't lie, like being at major labels for over a decade, it, it makes you feel, is there a world beyond that sometimes? But I thought it was a, a move worth 
pursuing um, in an age where we're all, like as an entire industry, constantly adapting to change. So it wasn't an easy decision, but it was one I was glad I was made. Yeah, and look, credit to, you know, the likes of yourself, Paris, to the cultural um, imprint that you're trying to bring to sound on, the type of artists that you're trying to bring there. You're not just trying to look for, I don't know, artists that uh, had a big moment yesterday. You are looking for artists that are doing great things tomorrow. And I think that was illustrated by the Leo Stay Trills track. Um, and, and we could definitely go on more even about that track and that journey. But I know that you know time may not necessarily be on our side and it would be a sin for us to not hear the journey and the, gem the gems from Susie. I feel like you've bigged me up a little bit too much. <laughs> I actually wouldn't say I've had the most exciting like journey into the music industry, but I've had to like, I think, because basically I grew up in like quite a small town in Gloucestershire with like literally zero gig venues at all. Um, and there was one kind of like heavy metal gig venue. And so that was like my only experience, which is quite literally not my thing at all. Um, but basically I grew up playing music, always loved playing music. I did all the grades in the piano quite young and was always just desperate to be like in and around it. And then um, I remember going to like a careers day at my school, which was like this quite like small like countryside school. And I said, I'd love to work in the music industry. I had no idea what I was talking about. Like I knew nothing about the music industry. I just thought that would be fun. Um, and he was like, hmm, what subjects do you, what subjects are you gonna take for A-level? And I was like, well, biology, history, you know, maths. And they were like, you should do biology. And then basically from that like one conversation, I went and did study biology at university, which was like crazy. Um, like the influence that people were like on like a 16 year old's mind, basically like, you know, and because I had nothing else in front of me and I had no idea how to reach anything, I just did it. Um, but I'm not mad that I did it. I picked a university in London. I went to UCL so that because I knew, I basically knew in London, like, I'd have so much opportunity. Like, I was like, at least if I get there and I have a student loan to, like, fall back on, um, you know, I had, like, my massive, like, maintenance loan because I couldn't afford, like, to actually, like, live here on anything else. So... I basically got that, did that, and then once I was in London, it all kind of went from there. I got this degree, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm doing today. Um, but I basically got like a temp role in the royalties department at Warner Music, and everything has like happened from there. So that's that happened about seven years ago. Um, I went into this royalties temp job, <laughs> like absolutely like, this isn't what I want to do, but I'm just going to see what happens. But I worked really hard. They kept me rolling for about a year and a half on this temp contract <laughs> in the royalties department. Um, and then HR came to me and they were like, there's a job going at ADA. Do you want to do that for a few months? So then I hopped over to ADA. So we actually didn't, we weren't there at the same time, but I did work with Max Ryder, <laughs> who you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And he worked um, for me. And he worked for you, so it's all connected. Um, <laughs> but he was amazing, actually. Max like connected me with so many A and R's around the company because he was like, I can see that you like want to be doing something creative and like you've come from this like science, like you know finance, all of that kind of thing. And he was like, you know, this is what I did. This is what you can be doing as well. Like, let me just give you that like first meeting with those people. Um, so I met like a load of A&Rs around the label, which was amazing because I, you know, often like if you just reach out to people cold, it's not always that you get given the opportunity. Um, so did all those meetings and everything. And then when my time came up at ADA, HR had come to me and said, you know, you're still like working really hard at this company, but there's an A&R assistant role that's come up at Warner Chapel. So I basically like went and met our head of A&R, who actually is going to be on the panel after this, and she gave me like my first actual job. Um, so I've been at Warner Chapel for five years now, um, and kind of like worked my way up to a manager. So I've been a manager for about two and a half years there. Tell us about some of the highlights you've had at Warner some Chapel. Some of my highlights. I've. It's been honestly. I'm. I feel so grateful to work in the music industry. It is so hard to get in. Sometimes like you know, you have to jump through all sorts of hoops to get there. But once you're like here, like honestly, all the hard work massively pays off. Like you work really hard, but you get to meet so many people, 
you get to connect with like managers, artists, like label people, all of that. Um, so I've signed a few people now, which is amazing. So this this year I've just signed Ants Live, who's an incredible rapper from London. He's very well known for his music videos. He's like cool, quirky, like all of that. So I'm super excited about him. I signed an artist called Nectar Wood, who's like an up and coming like soul artist from Milton Keynes, but she's based in London. Um, she's amazing. I re-signed Ari Pensmith, who wrote Water for Tyler, and he's incredible across a ton of stuff right now, um, including Tyler's project. But one of the things I also do is I run a lot of songwriting camps, so that's we probably like yeah. we've done a load of like session stuff together anyway. But um, I particularly the biggest camp that I run is is around wireless. So we take over the whole of a studio in West London, down the road actually, called Metropolis, and we've had like. I've done it three years in a row now, and this last year we had like Travis Scott came down, Sexy Red came down, Ruger, H, Hedy, like a, just a ton of like incredible artists. We ran it for a week straight, and yeah, it's just been like so fun to be able to be in those spaces, and like especially from where I've come from, which is like literally in the sticks somewhere, I grew up opposite a cow field, like literally. Um, so to come from that to like be here and amongst people doing like music stuff is amazing. So, and that's again another example of knowing when to pivot, being brave enough to pivot. Me personally, sometimes I feel that when we're based in London, we take a lot of things for granted. And so when you hear that someone's come from outside of London where they haven't got the music ecosystem or infrastructure and they've had to come into London and work their way up from the, ro the royalties department. You know, I mean, royalty statements are very important, but putting them together must be very boring. <laughs> so to kind of work your way up from, uh, sorry, no offense to anyone that works in the royalty <laughs> department. I've, you I've, you I've, have to learn stuff you have to though. Learn like it, it actually it was an amazing like important. grounding for like what like 100%. it made me understand like actually how that all kind Ro of works. Making sure you stay on top of your royalties yeah. is one of the most <laughs> important things in the music industry. Make, making me so. feel real bad for for uh, for not wanting to work in marketing back then. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so, but just to like just understanding the importance of getting your foot in the door and navigating through the industry is so important. Like. Susie just given an example of doing that across the space of seven years. Um, Aman spoke about 10 years. Josh, this is sound like in excess of 15 years, maybe 30. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Wiz has kind of given us, he took us all the way back to 2018. So being in the music industry is something that you gotta be passionate about. And it's something that you gotta be willing to play the long game in relation to. It's not about, I wanna get in the music industry tomorrow and buy a Lambo on Thursday. It, that's not the type of game you're in. And um, I feel why Susie's part is very important as well is the fact that she works in publishing. And publishing in our industry or in um, our culture, especially if we come from like local areas that we refer to as the ends and so on and so forth, it's, it tends to be like that missing 25% that a lot of us tend to neglect. So many people coming from um, our backgrounds don't you aren't even aware of publishing as a career and how creative and amazing it can be like just the whole concept of putting on camps inviting out mm. different artists producers and you're not standing behind any politics like you don't care you're not as fast as to you know the marketing spend in relation to that track or anything like that your main priority is just to get people in a room and make great music and so yeah that's amazing. Yeah, it feels like publishing feels like the like the actual essence of like the music industry because like you wouldn't actually have anything without songs. Like you have to have great songs to to go and spend money on marketing or make a video for or anything like that. But if you don't have a good song in the first place, you don't really have anything. <laughs> Do you know Facts. what I mean? So Facts. And so, you know, I'm gonna put a question to, to the floor. There's a lot of um, publications and internet blogs saying it's a bad time for, you know, UK rap, when really, I guess it's a bit of a challenging time for music in general. I just want to kind of get your opinion on that. Who would like to go first? I'll go. I don't think I would have ever, see when I'm talking about one of those most meaningful entry points for me was like when we were on Gang Science and Prayer 2017, Stormzy Vibes. 
I think that at that point in time, we thought he's broken through to the top. And 10 years later, less than 10 years, eight years later, Sanchez all over the States. Did we ever think that that was gonna be a thing? No, no, there's no way, right? So like my thing is, it's not a bad time for the UK. I think we democratize our audiences, but the world has democratized markets, right? So the UK, yes, it used to have a heavier hand in global industry. It's not necessarily the case now. I think what it means is you gotta collaborate globally to be global. That seems fair, right? So, you know, the UK is its own market, but I think in order to reach the top worldwide, you gotta be thinking str more strategically than ever in a world where there's never been more artists than there are today. So like, think about that, think about how you're gonna tap into France, Germany. Don't write off markets because they're not where you are. You know, it's like everything's out there and go and find it. Like there's never been more resource for a manager or an artist than there is today. In some ways that makes things easier, but in others it makes it more confusing. But I think the resources there and the markets, you know, you just gotta collaborate globally. I couldn't have said it about myself. Would anyone else like to chime in? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that like, you know, obviously because I work at a major publisher, we're very aware of what's in the charts and what's doing really well. For the most of this year, it has been quite dominated by the US. Um, so I wouldn't even necessarily specify like just UK rap. I think UK in general, like our artists kind of like, I think maybe things go in cycles. So artists release in certain cycles and it, we're just, we've been stuck in one of those cycles where those artists like Sabrina Carpenter, etc., are just taking over those kind of top spots. But then Stormzy just got number one on Friday. So, and it looks like it's gonna go number one again this week. So you've so got I to have think, a backbone, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that didn't land as well as it should have. No, I know. Hey, he is fun, I promise. Um, but I think that, you know, it's ever changing, so we have to always just stay open for it. And, like, even if we've had a season of like it being very U US, like, we know that we'll have, like, Dave will drop another track, you know, Sench will drop another track. Like, they're all, they're all, it's all going to come back around. So, um, I just think. We just need to be more creative in the UK in general. I wouldn't say other genres, to be honest, because they haven't, they ain't got a problem with um, reaching audiences far and wide. I think UK rap, we just we're we're in a transition moment. You know, we had the highs. We're not in a low. We're just not. I think we're getting rid of all the rubbish, and then all the guys who you know got music as a passion, who know, who are interested in being forward thinking and so on and so forth, they're gonna come to the forefront and we'll be shining again. Cause like, like I said, if you look at it, Central C, at the time when everyone was you know doing hard, hard drill, he came with playful drill, and now he's taken over the world musically. So that's just it, and everyone's gonna adapt, things will go back up in it, but it's first people, first first to the checkered line, and if you're gonna be the first person to say, yo, I'm gonna be forward thinking, like people like Len, you know, we've had a big underground um, scene in the UK for a long time, but he's actually starting to make a lot of traction, and not just in the UK, do you know what I'm saying? So it's just, I think if we get more creative, we won't be, we won't have no problems. Perfect, perfect. And I guess, I know um, Amon, you haven't spoken on this subject, but, I think I'm still stuck on this marketing budget. And I think now more than ever, artists need to um, be resilient. Future a rs future marketers need to be more innovative and resourceful. So could you give you know some pointers with relation to growth hacking and viral marketing, please? Um, I think obviously we were doing everything at, at the perfect time. Um, and it's just like adapting. Like, like you were saying earlier, um, whenever it's a bad time, that's the best time, in my opinion. It's the same with the stock market. When everyone starts selling stocks, it crashes, best time to buy stocks. It's the same with anything in any industry. And um, so pray that the music industry gets worse. It's the best time to get in. Um, that's how I see it. And in terms of like marketing for us, it's really simple, right? I think business, it's just, you've got to look at the basics, it's binaries, it's just profit and loss. It's like, I have a product and 
I'm going to give it to you. I don't need to go through a record label or any of this stuff, etc., etc. It's like, how do I access my fan base without going through all these middlemen? And then from there, how do I build a relationship with them? So like one of the things we were doing, which was long back in the day, was replying to every YouTube comment. When people say, oh, this is amazing, there's two answers you can do. Closed or thank you or oh amazing why do you think it's good blah 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 create a conversation for it that's it just ask open questions then they look back and be like oh my god you actually give a fuck about me you actually care that's it just care about your users and as a brand not many brands do that right just care about your users build relationships and then slowly word of mouth like spreads that's like the basics and um even now, most of my team still spend uh, most of their time engaging with the fan base, building relationships. Like even I would set aside time uh, just to have half an hour calls with random people in different parts of America that have used our product. And it's not really scalable, but it has such an impact that eventually it starts to snowball. And that's how I think you overcomplicate a lot of things. Obviously, yeah, TikTok is good and, and, all, and all that stuff, but sometimes just, just strip back to the basics. Build a genuine relationship with someone that's consuming your content. It's, it's like that. I love that. Audience building is definitely...